still to this day, as I interview creators, they'll talk about their resistance to email initially because they were so worried about bothering people. There's just so many psychological things going on when it comes to being a creator and sticking it out long enough. I've always believed that stories are really a gateway into understanding those things. Also just showing like the real ups and downs so that when you're having a low or you feel like something you're doing is not working, um, it reminds you not to give up that that's normal. In this episode, I talked to Issa Adney, who is a resident storyteller at ConvertKit. So that's not a normal role for tech companies to have, um, but it's something that we've done because we really want to be a part of the creator community and really understand the stories and the obstacles that the creators we serve are overcoming. So uh, Issa, we tell her story a bit. She came into ConvertKit as our webinar producer. So you get to hear the arc of what she was doing before, how she joined the team, and then how it morphed into the role that she has now. So we get into what makes great webinars, uh, systems and flywheels as a creator. She's very, very good at systems and not as a systems person. Like she's not someone who obsesses over that. She's someone who uses systems to be able to free up more time and output for, you know, more creative activities. Um, And then we just talk about reusing content, you know, and how you can create these systems and flywheels. So when you make one thing, it can really serve you know, the broader team and, and exist on all these different platforms. So it's a fun episode. Uh, I think you're going to love uh, both Isa and the stories that she's telling. Um, so afterwards, make sure to go ahead and subscribe to the uh, ConvertKit Stories uh, podcast, the Creator Stories podcast. And one other thing, if you're watching on video, you know this already, uh, but if you only ever listen on audio, we do release a video version of this show. Uh, it's on YouTube. If you just search YouTube for the Nathan Berry Show, there's two channels. There's one that is uh, purely clips, you know, so the short uh, one to two minute highlights. And then the other that's the full uh, episodes on video. This one, what just made me think of it is both Isa and I have signs in our background. Uh, mine says create, hers says inspire. And uh, anyway, the video just adds another element. So if you're just listening on audio, go check out the video version uh, on YouTube and subscribe. All right, let's dive in. Isa, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nathan. I'm happy to be here. This is a podcast about Taylor Swift and Lin-Manuel Miranda, correct? That is correct. The entire thing is actually just a uh, love story uh, to the two of them. And so, yes, you've come to the right place. Great, I'm ready. <laughs> uh, okay, I actually want to start since, you know, you you brought up Lin-Manuel in the first uh, 10 seconds, which is perfect. Um you have connections to all kinds of interesting creators. Like what what that just sparked is I know when you went to see Hamilton on Broadway, you like got a behind the scenes, you know, tour uh, of the, the set and everything. And then uh, I guess another version of that is uh, for your birthday. Was it last year or two years ago? Something like that. Uh, John Musker. Well, I'll, I'll say what he did first. He like drew you a caricature of yourself and like, uh, you know, it was like happy birthday, Isa. Uh, I had a pun in there and everything. And so for anyone who doesn't know who John Musker is, he's like one of the most famous uh, people at Disney ever, like directed Moana, Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Hercules, like, uh, and just this incredible animator and creative. And like, how do you know all of these people? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, the caricature is in my office right here, as well as my signed Little Mermaid and Moana posters. And um, it's really cool that you bring that up because that was one of the best days of my life. Um, and uh, I forget how crazy cool that is um, because we're face. I'm Facebook friends with John Musker now and I see pictures of all his new adorable grandkids and I forget that that is really, really cool. And so how I know these people, how this all happened, um, you know, it really started for me with being a writer. Um, And my first writing journey started in when I worked at a community college. My first book and my first blog was all about helping community college students. Uh, And, you know, I realized later in life that I was a writer and no matter where I had been in life, I probably would have written about it. Um, But community college was where I started and where I first got inspired. And so that's where I first started writing. It started with a blog in December, 2010. And, you know, if I really think about the first window to this world and to meeting all of these incredible creators, it was really, and I have never really thought about it until this moment, but it was really um, 
a summer series I did for the blog um, called First Job Out of College. And I wanted to interview people and tell stories about how people got their first job out of college in a way that hopefully taught community college students how to pursue that career path. And my childhood dream was to be a Disney animator because I know I went on some experience or ride at Disney, probably it was when it was called MGM. And at the time they had a studio there and you could see people drawing um, on the, you know, or coloring in my mind as a little kid. And I was like, coloring as a job? Awesome. Um, love to, I love to color, I still do to this day. Uh, I, I cannot draw. Um, I, and I'm not interested in drawing. So very quickly, that dream um, was not actually something I wanted to pursue. But, you know, looking back, there was something there. Um, there was something there about um, art and about creation and about stories, right, that I was drawn to when I was super young and I'm writing a book now about dreams. So I know like these dreams that spark young, there's always something there, even if the exact thing isn't, you know, what you end up doing or end up wanting to do. And so when I decided to do this interview series, I looked on LinkedIn. LinkedIn has been my best friend for a long time. Um, people who were local, I lived in um, Lake Mary, Florida at the time. And I just decided like, I wonder if there are any Disney animators. Like I'm fascinated by that world. I wonder if there are any. So Pytoon um, is his name. He worked on Lion King. I found him, he lived here. Uh, he worked on a bunch of films and he said yes. And we met at a little Starbucks in Lake Mary. And that was really the first interview in person that I remember um, that I think was really the seed for everything I'm doing now. And through Pytoon, um, you know, I read a book by a producer, Don Hahn, who did Lion King and Beauty and the Beast. And he's become a very important mentor and storytelling mentor in my life. Um, I read a book on creativity called Brainstorm. Highly recommend. And when I saw he'd worked on Lion King, I was just like, hey, Pytoon, do you know this guy? <laughs> Would you like introduce me? And he did. And then Don, you know, introduced me to John. And, you know, once you get into any creative world, if you really genuinely admire it and care about it and build trust with at least one person, um, people will really, really let you in if you do a good job, you know, in your initial connection. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. So uh, step one is to, to search Disney animators near me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I love it because you're going in and finding something that you really care about. And then uh, the blog gives you an angle of like, it's not just the, hey, let me pick your brain conversation. And people are like, what is this about? You know, but you're actually saying, you know, I'm a student and I'm writing about this or I've started a blog and I'm in pursuit of this thing. Would you be willing to sit down and talk about it? And then also the local connection, right? So one, you have a purpose, you know, and, and you're, you're on a mission to learn and accomplish something. And so people are like, okay, I want to help someone who's on a mission, who's like has a purpose. And then two, oh, you're local. Okay. Yeah. Like I'll help someone local, you know, and then uh, probably the, like the student angle helps a lot too. Everyone wants to help students. And so uh, in that way, you know, you can get really specific about who you're trying to reach. And I guess the, the last thing there is that you weren't saying like, how do I meet famous people? No. You know, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> right? Like that, because you could cast such a wide umbrella and you're like, no, no, no. I want to meet Disney animators, you know, and then we can branch out to storytellers from there and like, and, and I can, but starting hyper specific. Is there anything else in the, like if someone was um, going to try to replicate that and saying like, okay, I want to, you know, connect with uh, these creators who like are my idols. Is there anything else in that process that that we missed that you'd recommend? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously being a student or being young, you know, can really help. I wasn't a student when I first reached out to PyTune, but I was early professional. It was my first job out of college, you know, so that definitely helps. I'm 34, gonna be 35 now, that doesn't work anymore. And so for anyone who's not a student or really young, I think what the next thing is what you said, Nathan, like the mission. If you're creating something where you have a mission that you really care about and you're reaching out to that person because of that mission, um, that alone um, 
can make a huge difference. So I think that's number one. And then number two, this has always been something that is really important to me. And it means there's certain people I've actually had like an opportunity to reach out to or to even interview and I didn't because this wasn't here. And for me, that's a genuine appreciation for the work that they do. Um, I remember once for my book, I reached out to a PR person and the, the person I wanted to interview wasn't available, but they gave me like three other kind of celebrities that I could choose from. And I actually decided not to because none of them did work that I truly appreciated and that I truly admired. And especially because I'm not famous or have like a giant platform to me, what I can offer them is that genuine appreciation, is that insight into their art and what I can pull out of it when I tell their story and show the world how beautiful what they're making is and help them learn something from how they got there. So I think if you're looking for people who you actually truly Truly, you read their book, you saw their thing, you you really saw something in it. You can't fake that and people will know when you're faking that. Right. Um, and I think, um, you know, people will respond to it. Not everybody, but the right people, they just, they do. They respond to it. And I've become really good friends with almost everyone I've interviewed. And I think that's because it starts from that place. And usually I have found when you connect with someone, um, it, you, you usually have a lot in common. There's usually something there that you're reading into their work that connects with something deep with you and it, it ends up creating a friendship. And so for me, that's been huge. And then when it comes to, if it's someone who's really unreachable, um, you know, that can be really hard and, and you can't always start there, but those introductions help, you know, and you don't want to just connect with someone who you know is connected with them to get to them. That's gross. Um, but usually, you know, look around because often I've found that if there's someone who's really visible that I really admire, if you look at who's working with them, um, you're going to find other people who you admire just as much and you actually have a chance at access because they're not super busy with publicity, you know, or they're not um, a, a celebrity in that way. And so they're also more open sometimes to talking or to being featured on a podcast or um, in a story because that's not something they're often asked to do. And uh, sometimes that can open doors, but you never want to do that with that goal in mind because that would also be gross. And they, you know, people would read into that as well. Right. I think something else is that you're often reaching out to uh, people who are a little bit more behind the scenes, like you have to be a fan to know who they are. Right. And so if we're, and, and like the director of a movie is like, obviously a really big name in that space, but people are going to know, like for, for a movie like Moana, they're going to know the main, uh, you know, cast, they're going to know Dwayne Johnson, right. As they think about Maui or something like that. Right. And so they're going to be less thinking about who the animator was, who the director was, or that kind of thing. And so um, it's just interesting of, of reaching out to the people who are a little more behind the scenes with their craft, but just as much of a role in creating the, you know, the final product. Exactly, exactly. And also, you know, you never know what can happen on Twitter um, with, with people. I think when I think about some of the people, like who are the really big or bigger people who I didn't have like another connection to and and I didn't necessarily reach out initially. Um, two of the big ones for me were Zach Knighton, who was the lead character on my favorite sitcom, Happy Endings. He's now on Magnum uh -huh. PI. And then um, Andrew Freed, who technically is in more behind the scenes, um, but he heads up all of Boardwalk Pictures, which did Chef's Table and Cheer and so many films on Netflix that I absolutely adore. And those were people that I would have said, you know, definitely felt out of reach, not like I could just directly be like, hey, wanna can I interview you for my blog? Um, but how Zach Knight happened is I was watching an episode as I do, and he had said saw a joke about Alexander Hamilton uh, trying to cover up his Alex tattoo from his ex uh, fiance. And it, this is an older show, so I tweeted that like uh, his character Dave was was very prescient and was like ahead of the times with his Hamilton reference. And he liked that. He followed me back. And so when people follow you back, that's usually when I'm like, OK, now I'm going to message him and tell him. And I was already a huge fan, especially of this particular scene in the pilot, you know, which I reference and right. and asked him if he would be willing to interview. And um, he could have easily said no. And for whatever reason, he said yes. And we met in person in L.A. 
And uh, it was right before Magnum PI, before he got that job. So he was like in between jobs, kind of like, I don't know what's going to happen next. It was such a cool moment. And we've stayed really, really good friends. And um, and then Andrew Freed, I, when I did my first film, I, you know, tagged him and said, like, this man is why I got behind a camera. And that's true. Um, and I won't go into all the reasons why, but that's really true. And so eventually he followed me back. And then when I was going to be near his studio, I made the ask and... He said yes. So I think, you know, looking at those people who've really impacted you, you, you never know. Yeah, that's good. And I I often find, I was actually just having this conversation uh, in the ConvertKit Slack uh, with the team this morning about reaching someone. Often they're really big on some platforms and not on others. And so like the creator we were talking about had like millions of followers on TikTok, uh, hundreds of thousands on Instagram and like 3000 on Twitter but they were actively using Twitter. And so you could tell they, they used each one for a different thing. And so that was a case where I was like, well, if I was going to reach out to that creator, I would do it on Twitter where, you know, there's so much less noise. They're maybe more of a personality on TikTok and more of just themselves, you know, on, on Twitter. And so finding that place where uh, you can follow their work, you know, message them exactly what you're saying of like the, the little things that demonstrate that you're a real fan. Um, and then you're right, when you get that follow back, uh, my biggest follow of the month of January as I've been growing my Twitter audience is Ryan Reynolds. Oh, I know. So, I was so excited yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm yes. like, who knows? Maybe there's a, you know, maybe we can interview him for something. Yeah, just, like, I, he's amazing. <laughs> he only follows like a thousand people. So Oh, I looked. I was like, like heck yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you click in and you're like, oh, he probably follows like everybody, you know? And you're like, oh, oh. Okay. Right. He didn't respond to my DM though. So we'll see. That's okay. You never know. It's All good to play the long game. <laughs> Always the long game. Okay. So when you started, like how long have we worked together now? Oh, four years? and a half years, almost five. It'll be five yeah. this year. Yeah. Uh, so when you came and joined ConvertKit, it was for our webinar producer role. And so you were, you had your whole background as a writer, but we actually knew you getting into like television and on screen type stuff. And, and so how did that come together of you, you know, finding the role at ConvertKit and then, and then joining the team? Yeah. So I, um, in community college, I was asked to be in a commercial. It was the first time I was really on camera and the guy was a producer. He did lots of, uh, Orlando things, Disney things. And I was just being as myself, being a student, you know, and he was like, you're really good, you know, and I am, a type A person. So I was like, oh, thank cool. You know, uh, I'm like really good at this thing. That's exciting. Um, and I always did goofy camera stuff with my brother my whole life, but I like, did not think anything of it. Oh gosh, it's bad. Um, but I, um, you know, sort of like, you know, had that encouragement. And then once I wrote up my first book, I got a consulting job with this big um, publishing company and we started doing video series. I had this whole campaign idea, just how my brain worked. Storytelling has always been part of what I do, you know? And so I had the story idea and they wanted me, you know, people usually ask me to be in front of the camera. I was rarely, you know, asking to be, um, but I enjoyed it. And people really responded well. It felt like a way I could tell a story. So I worked at, um, I did a TV show for four years and of, and I started a YouTube channel, you know, as part of my community college blog. So I did lots of work there and I uh, really loved it. Um, and then I had this big transition where I was ready to move away from the community college education world. I felt like that season of my life was ending and I wanted to move into something new. And I didn't know what that was. And it was a really scary time. I was working on the book that I'm turning into my publisher this June. Uh, so that was eight years ago. I've been working on this for a long time. So I knew writing was something I was going to be doing, but I, you know, wasn't under the assumption that like, oh, I'm just, I can just be a full-time author. Like that just didn't enter my mind because it just didn't seem like something, um, you could do that you hear in the world, right? It's like, yeah, Nicholas Sparks or, you know, there's like four authors that people will say are doing it. So like my mind just wasn't going there. I was like, I'm going to write. I definitely want to be a writer. Um, I knew whole other story, but like I knew I didn't want to move to New York and work as an assistant for five years at a magazine. I could also sense that like that world was changing too. And I don't even know if the job I'd want would be there by the time I could get it. So I just didn't know what to do. My husband and I moved to San Diego. I got a job at a gym. 
I don't know if we've talked much about this, Nathan, um, but I worked at a fitness center doing sales, like starting a, a brand new one in Solana Beach, California. And I just was trying out like that whole day job artist thing, you know, like, okay, I'm going to be an artist with like a day job, like actors who, you know, work at a coffee shop and then go on auditions. Let me try that. And I did that for about nine months and I loved the people there. But I just like I couldn't it didn't work for me um, because for me, like I wanted to grow. So already I was training people. I got really into the software. I got to be the webinar person. Um, I would go on all the big corporate webinars and then train everyone on the software. And I loved it. And shocker, I started writing our email newsletter and I started telling stories about people who had health goals and then achieved them. I interviewed them, wrote stories. So I, I realized like I wanted to keep growing. And I was like, well, I don't really want like a gym. A fitness center is not like my career path, but I can't turn this off. So it was kind of like, you know, I um I need to shift gears. I think I want to get a job in a th- place where I do want to grow, where it really fits more who I am. And so I was living in San Diego. I looked at jobs in San Diego and I looked for jobs remotely. And I my mentor, Don Hahn, is a producer. And so the title of the job being webinar producer was what really first caught my attention. It's like, oh, cool. You know, I I like the idea of being a producer. And then, um, <laughs> you know, I, you know, obviously read more into it and was just thought the job sounded so great. I had obviously done a lot of training and teaching and being on TVs. And I was a blogger um, for many years. So that all and a creator myself. So I just that all really connected with me. But um, what really, really drew me to it, Nathan, and I don't think you're fishing for this answer. I know you're not, because I don't even know if I've ever told you this, told other people this, um, but it was you. You know, I was nervous about like tech company, tech bros. I don't know if this would be a yeah. world for me. I'd come from this very like, you know, education world, very diverse world. And I wasn't, you know, the little I knew was, uh, not for me. And so I was like, well, let me let me learn more about it, though, because I just there's something cool here. And I loved the website and I loved everything I was reading. And then I listened to a couple of podcasts where you were on them and I watched a craft and commerce. This all is coming full circle from where how I started oh, yeah. this because I was just making a joke about Lynn and Taylor, but they're a big part of um, my life and our our uh, friendship. Um, but you came out to a Taylor Swift song, a craft and commerce. Yep. And I was just like, OK. This guy is cool. I like him. <laughs> um, and it wasn't like ironic. You were like, you liked this. I was like, OK, that's cool. But but really, it was who you were as a person, the story behind ConvertKit, hearing you talk about how, your decision to go all in on it when you were, you know, in your own season of life where you're trying to figure out what to do next. And I that was it for me. I was like, oh, my gosh, yes, I really, really want to work here. Um, and for my interview, we had to, I had to like record a video teaching someone how to set up a blog. And of, I just remembered the literally I the like imagery I used was Hamilton related. And I know the video had like a Hamilton vibe. So there you, there you go. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. So you came on and took over producing all of our webinars, which I was producing them before or hosting them or, or whatever. I didn't do all of them. Uh, uh, Daryl, who was leading our growth team at the time, would teach some of them and we'd kind of have a a cast of characters, but we needed someone to run it full time and really level that up because we were like, okay, how can we scale this business quickly? Do you remember how many webinars you did for ConvertKit? No, I should really, uh, I should really go back and count. But I but mean, it's in, the, in the hundreds, hundreds for sure. Oh man, because <laughs> there were times that you were doing four or more a week. Oh yeah, like there, I, I remember. It, it probably averaged out to like 15 to 20 a month. Yeah. But th- I think there were some really crazy weeks in there. I remember you talking about like, okay, I uh, like I've done six this week or seven this week. And I'm going to like <laughs> take, go take into a back. cave. <laughs> 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 yeah. Two in one day once. Oh, that was that was crazy because the webinar is like. I, you know, it's funny because in Zoom, I don't know if other people have noticed this, but, you know, a lot of times in Zoom, people will be like, I can't read the chat. You know, they'll do their presentation like, but I can't look at the chat. And I I think about Angel, too, because I'm sure she feels the same way. Our webinar producer now is fabulous. I'm like, 
So when you do webinar, you're looking at the chat. Um, it is this whole other level of being on because you are presenting and you're really wanting to interact with everyone there. And it re I still remember the feeling of like hitting live and my brain kind of going like, and I was like, I had two brains and I could yes. present at the same time, like genuinely and be reading a chat. And sometimes there was that third brain of like also working on some technical difficulty without showing it. Um, <laughs> so, and, and what, What's cra still crazy to me to this day, because the webinars would always be scheduled for an hour, but they would often go to like 90 minutes and we would we would finish our part within the yeah. hour so people could go. But people were just so into it and we would have such a good time. And so it would be like the most intense hour and a half of of my life. But so enjoyable. I had I still have I haven't let go of it. I have like a webinar playlist on my phone still that I'd listened to before everyone. And it was just such a it was such an experience, it's such a high and uh, quite quite the zone. But yes, doing when you're doing a couple of those in that zone, whew, you got to you have to balance with uh, lots of alone time. Yeah, exactly what you're saying of like the multiple tracks going at once, because you get to the point where you know the material so well. Right. That there's one track that's delivering the material. And then there's that second track. It's like, OK, this <laughs> this AV thing, something is going wrong and I'm fixing it. And then the third track of like, oh, what's the audience saying? OK, what are they engaged with? <laughs> you know, yep, this is resonating. And it's wild. It's it's quite a skill. I never got to your level on it. I'm very thankful <laughs> that you took it over <laughs> because, uh, yeah, it, it was a whole thing. But it drove so much growth for the business. Like hundreds of thousands of dollars of monthly recurring revenue from these creators who were like, uh, not just getting a pitch on ConvertKit, but really getting a lesson on how do you grow your audience? How do you use the tool? You know, cause it was very, uh, and, and they still are the webinars that Angel is um, doing now. Um, you know, they're very educational, like much more, I think when people hear webinar, they probably, t if they're in the industry, they tend to think of a, a pitch and really ours are much more of workshops of, like you walk away from, you know, the 60 or 90, 90 minute class feeling like you've learned, learned really a lot. And we call them workshops now, too. And I think something that's really powerful for anyone thinking about video in their business is um, just how much people feel connected to you and, you know, really, really see you differently when you're on camera. I mean, I've seen it from both directions. So, you know, in one direction, we have this creator who is she's in L.A. She's very well connected in Hollywood. Her husband's very famous and she thinks I'm like, like she'll talk to me and about me and with me um, like I'm on that level. And I just laugh. I'm like, oh, I'm at the bottom of your list. Um, but she spent so much time with me on camera. There's something about the camera that creates that magic that is really, really cool. And I've noticed it on the other end because I've started watching vlogs in the last few years. I really was late to that train. And there's all these Disney vloggers. And, you know, they might have like 300 subscribers on their YouTube channel. They're not big, but like I'll see it in the park and I'll like get the same similar feelings that I got. Like when I saw Lynn Memo Miranda, I'm like, this is wild. What, you know, the camera is uh, pretty crazy in that way, but I think it's also a really good reason to think about, you know, adding video. It's very scary for people, but um, you know, they'd be surprised like how that can deepen your connection. With yeah, um, the creator you're talking about, are you talking, referring to Kimberly Brooks? Or is it someone else? Okay. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I was just thinking, <laughs> she's been on the podcast. Uh, actually, she sent me her her book, uh, which the new oil painting, which is really good. My background, uh, you know, I, I think as everyone knows, listening to this, this is my podcast, um, <laughs> is in like, you know, writing and design. And I mean, it won't show up on the video, but like her design of everything in the, the book is so good. It's so good. Uh, she's amazing. Yeah. Love her so much. Um, okay, so I think there's a lot of people, we'll get into storytelling more in a second, but um, a lot of people who are listening who might be considering webinars or workshops, and you've done so many of them. I think there are not that many people out there. You know, like you're probably in the top 100 people for a quantity of, of uh, workshops taught, you know, like in our industry. What advice would you have for someone who's saying, okay, I, I think I'm gonna do workshops, you know, how do I make them good? What should my process be? Uh, any of those things. 
Yeah, I think number one would be watch as many workshops as you can and study them. Um, study your own reaction. What do you like? What do you hate? Um, what um, do you think is working? What do you think is not working? Um, you know, I just did this for my book where I've been, been really struggling with the introduction and I read 12 introductions. And I did this. Right. What do, what is the I, I looked at their format. I looked at what I like, what I didn't like. And it was the best thing I've ever done. And I did the same thing with webinars and I constantly did it. Um, and so I think you can learn both from a good and a bad webinar um, and from all different industries. Anywhere you see anyone doing some kind of live training, watch it or watch recordings um, and figure out what what's working and apply that to what you're doing. I think number two is also don't be afraid to find your own style um, and really be really be yourself. Um, I think people really connect with that. They really appreciate that. Um, and I think thinking through also your sales strategy and what is aligned with the business goals, but also, you know, what feels right for your brand. Um, you know, one thing I loved about the ConvertKit webinars when I came on was that they would start by saying, you know, the, the, everything you're going to learn in this workshop, like you can use no matter what email service or, uh, you know, that mm -hmm. you're using. And I thought that was so cool when I first came on. I was like, oh, wow, it just gave me a sigh of relief. And you could feel that doing webinars in the future that it gave everyone a sigh of relief. It, it became a more genuine interaction. It was like, yeah, you know, obviously they know I work at ConvertKit and I tell them there's going to be right. things at the end, uh, really free things, because that's all we ever did. That was also really cool um, and free gifts and things. But it it really, really created a, a nice relationship and it was about adding value. And I felt really lucky to work for a place that, you know, believed in that and believed in we're going to help creators. We actually had this greater mission than just make as much money as you possibly can. Not that revenue isn't incredibly important because uh, it helps us further our mission, but it wasn't money over mission, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that uh, you could feel that. And I think people could feel that. And I think it's why our workshops were so successful. So I think also finding that. But I've also been on great workshops that were about selling a thousand dollar thing. And I've seen that done beautifully. Um, so I think that's where it also helps to look at what you're trying to do, look at examples and um, and also, you know, you just got to do them and do them over and over. And that's where the best best learning happens um, and and eventually you get like this rhythm and it just becomes about serving people. And I still see the chat like the, I write stories now and I just love that I had two years like in this chat because to me, like I'll go like this, like it's alive to me. I can feel those creators, their questions, their hopes, their what discouraged them. And when I'm interviewing another creator for a story or for a film, I still see that chat and I am looking for them to say things that I know would make the chat go crazy, you know, because that was like my first real connection to creators. So I think that's also a really great benefit and something to look out for when you're doing workshops, whether you have 12 people at your first workshop or you have, you know, hundreds or thousands. That is such a beautiful way to connect with your ideal customers and learn from them and even build other content from what you see from that community. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so good because like having that hands-on connection to the journey that each creator is trying to go through, you know, cause you're catching them at the point where they have 10 subscribers or zero, or they're at a hundred and trying to go to 500, right? Cause so much of our content was around how do you grow your audience that I remember we would always ask how many subscribers do you have, you know, and the chat would just go crazy, you know, zero, 10, a hundred, 500, you know, and just like flying by <laughs> there's hundreds or thousands of people on this webinar. Um, and just that little insight, because I think we pay attention to the creators who have already made it. You know, they're the YouTube channels, the podcasts, the newsletters that we follow, right? You come across them. Statistically, you're more likely to come across someone who has 100,000 followers. You're going to come, you know, uh, than someone who is just getting started, right? Because only 100 people know that they are actually doing this creative thing. And so the workshops were this, this lens into the people who really needed our help the most. And that was really cool. So... And there's so many great stories in there. I want to transition to talking about stories because when was it? Was it two years ago, three years ago? When, when did you transition from webinars to full-time yeah, storytelling? Yeah, about two and a half years ago. It was about, it was summer of um, 
whatever that summer two and a half years ago was. <laughs> yeah, summer wow. of 19. Yeah. <laughs> what was the vision for uh, this new role? Because it's not something that exists normally, right? Like storytellers exist uh, in the form of writers and all of that at like major film studios. Uh, and then like webinar producer is a relatively new role in you know, like software tech, but say the last like five to eight years, like that kind of thing. But then the storyteller role isn't something that exists. So like, what was your initial vision for it? And then also, we, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. And then I want to hear about your process of pitching it to, <laughs> to me and to others. I mean, if you're like, are you even going to go for this? Yes. You know? uh, yeah. I, <laughs> that's a good story too. Um, so initial vision where I had seen a lot, uh, I had seen, I shouldn't say a lot, but I'd seen a couple of jobs of people who were like customer storytellers and they weren't, I don't think storyteller was in the name, but that's just how I remember it. Um, but I saw these jobs where people were in tech where their, their whole job was to tell customer stories and probably more in the line of use cases, right? And case studies and things, but it piqued my interest. I was like, oh, that's interesting. There is a job where people are telling stories. And, you know, by this time I had been running my own storytelling blog and still working on my own profile based book where I interviewed 120 people for many years, right? I was, you know, doing webinars and then on days off or time off, I would take a train to LA and go interview someone and tell their story for, for my blog because that was something I'm just wildly passionate about. I, I just love to do um, so, so, so much. I love writing stories. And uh, when I stopped for my book, I realized I didn't want to stop. My, I love the profile medium. So I was thinking about, okay, how, how could we put those two things together? And so my real vision was, especially in line with our mission of, of serving creators, was what if instead of telling like a pure case study of here's how this creator got this many subscribers and that's we i love those and we need those and we have those but i thought you know what if we took what rolling stone does and vogue does when they have a cover story and they tell someone's story in a way where you feel like you get to meet that person you understand who they are you understand their mindset and the other things that help them be who they are today um what if we did that for creators, this world that people are still learning about? You know, Nathan, you're, you're an early adopter. And in some ways I am too. I never think of myself as, but, you know, I started a blog in 2010. Um, yeah. But, you know, for us, like, oh yeah, being a creator, duh. But for most of the world, we're just seeing the mass media being like, wow, the creator economy. Um, and so it's still it's still new now. It was definitely still felt very new two and a half years ago because the mass media certainly wasn't talking about creators. And I thought, you know, what if we elevated creators um, in this way and gave the creators we're seeing is doing amazing things the same treatment? as Rolling Stone in Vogue. Let's tell their profiles. Let's tell their stories. Because what I was finding, while I think there's a ton to learn from a case study, especially when you think of the chat in those those creators who are working towards things. Um, yes, they needed to know how to use the software. Yes, they needed to know how to grow. That's what we talked about. But you know, you mentioned when we'd ask them, like, how many subscribers do you have? And there would always be this these people like zero, womp womp, or like three, oh, so sad, or it's just my mom. And we'd have this whole pep talk of like, no, like you're doing it um, and helping people reframe their mindset. And there was so much of that. I mean, still to this day, I as I interview creators, they'll talk about their resistance to email initially because they were so worried about bothering people. Um, and and uh there's just so many psychological things going on when it comes to being a creator and sticking it out long enough. And there's a lot of mindset stuff. Um, and I have always believed that stories are really a gateway into understanding those things and maybe giving you some tools <laughs> to rethink um, how you're thinking about things. Also just showing like the real ups and downs so that when you're having a low or you feel like something you're doing is not working, as always happens in anything we pursue, um, it reminds you not to give up and that that's normal. Um, I am a woman of color. I have dealt with a lot of imposter syndrome and I get discouraged very easily. It's such a quick thing between this isn't going well to like, oh, it must be me. I must not be doing right. a good job. And it's, it's very deeply rooted. And for me, stories were always what picked me back up. 
always reminded me that, oh, this is normal. Oh, look, they've been here too. This is a sign I'm doing it, not a sign that I'm, you know, actually failing um, in, in the bigger, broader sense. And so I thought it could really serve creators in that part of their journey, um, keep them going longer, um, keep them creating long enough to get where they want to go, because it does take a long time um, and that can be really hard. And so I wanted the stories to serve creators that way. Um, and also enhance the ConvertKit brand and show people, you know, we always talked about creators being the heroes of our brands. And we had done these projects like I'm a blogger, the book and the documentary series, which I was always incredibly inspired by. Um, so I thought, why not bake this into what we're always doing and um, and also, you know, elevate those creators and show them in the way show other people, help other people see them the way we see them um, and one of my favorite stories is Brandis Daniel. And I um, did a story about her. And then by the time it came out, she had also been in Vogue. And I just, yes. it was, that was just so cool because those kind of feature stories were what first inspired me. For everyone listening, uh, give like the, the high level of who Brandis Daniel is and some of the things she's done. Oh my gosh. Well, she um, is the founder of Harlem's Fashion Row. And she, you know, 14 maybe years ago now, maybe 15, um, you know, she started it and she is someone who definitely worked over the long haul. She saw that there were not enough um, people of color represented in the fashion industry, especially designers of color. And so she went on, talk about mission. She went on a mission to change that. And um, she did. And she stuck it out for a really, really, really long time. Um, she also worked with LeBron James and designed a shoe. And she's been someone who I still follow on Instagram and inspires me so, so much. Um, and that was a story that I I was changed by. And um, and I often am by every single every single one, um, which is I think the first time I'm not that would be, you know, the time where I'm like, oh, is this still what we should be doing? Is this still helpful? Um, and so I'm always that barometer is like, how do I feel after an interview? How do I feel after I've written a story so far? Two and a half years. I mean, I literally could tell you all about how the one I wrote yesterday shifted my thinking and inspired me. And uh, and that that's certainly what keeps me going and what I hope is translating to people who are reading and and listening and watching because that media has spread now. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. And just the amount that we've produced um, over that period of time, um, like so many incredible stories. And we just end up with this deep connection to our customer base. Like I think of uh, Kay He from Rad Reads, who he's been on this podcast. Uh, so you can go back and listen to that episode. But um, he, or I mean, he's a diehard ConvertKit fan, um, but also not only because he's invested so much in uh, ConvertKit as far as like his audience and the community he's built, but then also we've invested in him uh, in the way that we've, we tell his story uh, we've taught co-workshops with him. Uh, and then we made a whole film, you know, uh, about him and like his story and, and, uh, so it just results in this really deep connection with everyone that we work with. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Henry, to get B-roll, Henry is our filmmaker um, yes. for Kay's story, ended up going to Kay's parents, I think, apartment in New York and had dinner with them and just had this whole bonding experience. So uh, especially with films, you know, we spend three full days with them. You really form a really, really special bond. And it, it's one of my favorite things about my job. Yeah. Okay. So before we dive into the whole production process and, and all of that, uh, what was the, the experience of, of pitching me and the rest of the leadership at ConvertKit of like, Hey, uh, I want to stop doing webinars. We should hire someone else for webinars. I want to tell stories. Yeah. It was scary. And I really honestly <laughs> didn't, I mean, I was really, uns I really didn't think it was going to happen. Honestly. Um, I, especially because at the time we had a 50 person rule, right? Where we were only, yeah, we were gonna right. cap hiring at 50. And so I was just like, they're, you know, this is a software company. They don't need a storyteller. If we're only hiring 50 people, a storyteller is not what we need. We're gonna need another engineer, right? You know, that was my, again, imposter syndrome <laughs> really coming out. But I, I really discounted myself um, right away. I actually had some encouragement from someone else who was like, no, you should try. Um, you know, you should just try. And so I'm so thankful to that person. Um, and truly, honestly, and I think you know this, Nathan, but it's only something I've just started really talking about because I've just started to come out of it. It's hard to tell a story when you're in the middle of a story. Um, but I 
you know, frankly, just had a really traumatic event happen in my family health life that is still ongoing. And it was really, really intense. And it was my first real trauma that I've ever been through. And I didn't know any better um, it, it to like take time. You know, I just had no idea. I had a webinar the next right. day and it was with a big affiliate. And anyone at ConvertKit, if they had known, would have been like, oh my gosh, take all the time you need. We have bereavement leave. The company would have been so supportive, but I didn't even think to ask. I didn't even think to, you know, it was just, this is important. And when you're in trauma, you're just not even thinking straight. So I did webinars. I was smiling and doing my thing when I was just really broken inside because of some really awful things that had happened. And so I kind of did some damage to myself uh, to the point where then all of a sudden I couldn't be on camera anymore. I just couldn't. And so in some ways that breaking point helped because I was like, well, I've got to do something else. What else do I want to do? This is it. Um, why don't I just try? Because I don't want to leave ConvertKit. This is the best company ever. And so um, that gave me the courage. And I had actually written, I had, I know I had been thinking about this beforehand because I wrote a like a temp story. Um, m m months ago and I had showed it to a director and I think they had said like, oh, that's cool. But it just, you know, it, there was just so much going on, you know. And um, so I had set some stage, even though I don't think I thought about that and at the time. I'm just now remembering that. Um, but yeah, it was scary. But I had encouragement and it wasn't as scary in the sense that I, you know, I felt really a lot of support from my manager at the time. And and I knew it wasn't, you know, it helped that it wasn't like it was completely out of the blue. We had done a book, we had done a documentary series. Um, so that certainly helped. Um, but I I didn't know which way it was gonna go. It was real scary. Right. And I was really excited that that vision was, you know, supported. And I think my it helped that my manager had done a lot of customer storytelling in his previous role. So he really believed in it and he got it initially. Um, so I don't know what he said, but I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, for sure. And so that was a whole thing. We'd done storytelling as one-off projects before, right? We, as you mentioned, we'd produced the I am a blogger book, um, and the, the documentary series to go with it. But really what you did was turn storytelling from a project into a system or a flywheel that's ongoing. So what does that look like? You know, as we're, uh, taking a creator where we want to tell their story, it shows up in all these different places in ConvertKit and there's a lot of byproducts products of it. But I just love to hear kind of uh, start to finish of what that process is. Yeah, I am a I am a systems flywheel master, I have to say. Um, and so I love doing that. I had done it with webinars and, you know, this repeatable system. And so I really applied the same philosophy to stories. And, you know, it really started with that first story, that first interview, Tanya. Um, and, you know, back then, pre 2020, I like went, did some creator stories in person, which was really incredible. And so she was a food blogger and we cooked in her kitchen and I tasted her food and that was really incredible. And so um, with every step from asking her for the interview, then, OK, we need to get a story release form um, working with our lawyer. And so for me, it's all about doing that first one and logging every single step. Um, I have a chart. And so that the second one I do, I'm just repeating those steps. And when I come against something that needs to change, I change it in a way that will change it for all the future ones in sort of this, um, you know, system that I have. And so it got refined over and over um, with each story. Um, the first story was just written. And, you know, then I really, you know, we had some photography in the project, right? The book. Um, right. And I had been using just photography they were giving me, but I really saw an opportunity will, of, you know, hey, if we had professional photography that we owned, not only would it enhance the story, but we'd have photography then that we can use all across the website. Maybe even, right. you know, we had now there's a photo of Cortland when you sign into the app and that gives me chills every time I see it um, because that was something I was really hopeful for. You know, we had talked about creators being the heroes of our brand. And so you know, the internet is such a visual medium. So I thought, okay, let's add photos. And then hiring photographers, that became part of the flywheel. And then we decided to do films right away. It just took some time to hire a filmmaker. Um, so we added that to the flywheel, figuring out when to reach out. Do we do a story first? Do we do a film first? And um, when 2020 happened, um, films had to go on pause. 
And we're like, well, we're enjoying telling stories in all these different mediums. How do we get another medium out there if we can't be in person, if we can't film? And so um, that's how the podcast came about is I was like, well, what if I read the story <laughs> and um, we put that on a podcast? And what I really cared about, and I still get so much feedback on this to this day, is let's have a player at the top of the story so someone can just hit play and listen to it while they're doing something else. Um, and most, a lot of people I talk to <laughs> talking about stories, like that's how they read them. That is through listening. And, and I had gotten that idea, frankly, from a course that I was taking that was a written course, but she also had a player at the top. And that's what I always used. I love that side of it where it's like you come across a story and you're like, yeah, let me read this. You know what? You said, why don't you read the story to me? Right. <laughs> and you just hit play at the top. <laughs> right. It's like, I'm going to do the dishes. You read the story to me. And you're like, you know, like it's a little virtual Issa going I'm like, oh, sure. Yeah, I'll read the story to you. Yep. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> so that's been and it's just this like flywheel. I do the same thing every time, but the story is always different. And now it's, you know, a pretty well oiled machine. And um, that's been really great because then we can up level other things and find other ways to tell stories and make sure, um, you know, the stories stories are incorporated in everything that we do. So that's been really cool. And that's where the, you know, webinar hosting and things came into play, being able to like perform a story. Um, and a lot of that came from you, Nathan, asking me to tell customer stories at retreats. And often right. people would come up to me after and be like, oh, I that was so great. You need to, you know, I would listen to a podcast on that. And so I really have our, our teammates to thank for my thinking about that podcast because I don't think I would have you know, or would have taken me longer to go there um, had I had not had that feedback. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. And we have a retreat coming up uh, in a few days. And so I can't wait. Uh, we'll have to talk about what stories we're going to tell. Um, <laughs> we'll save that for offline. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, one quick thing you talk about, you said that you're a master at systems and flywheels. And uh, there's an example of that that is so true, where I remember at a retreat, we were in Oceanside, California, and for some reason on the marketing team, well, we were trying to get better at systems. And, you know, either uh, Derek or director of marketing asked you to, or you volunteered or something and be like, oh, well, I'll show you the system that I use, you know? And then you just like proceeded to do this whole masterclass on like systems and flywheels. And the whole team is like, Issa, we had no idea, like that that's incredible <laughs> what you have going on. And you're, this isn't what you said, but I, like, I imagine, you know, of being like, yeah, well, you didn't think that happened automatically. Like, you know, come on, like, <laughs> have this whole system behind it. So as you're thinking about someone's creative process, I think a lot of creators are just like, oh, I write when I'm inspired. I, uh, you know, I, I don't know whatever else, right? I just show up and the magic happens or that's how all of this works. But I think the best creators are the ones who have systems and flywheels. And so what advice would you give on helping someone identify and build out what their flywheel is for, you know, their craft or whatever they're trying to produce. Yeah. I think the number one thing is figuring out your like motivation and what you want the most and understanding then how the flywheel is going to get you there. So for those artists, artists, like which I, you know, I'm definitely a type A artist, um, but I am an artist. I am a creator. And so what actually motivates me when it comes to flywheels, um, it, it is art. Um, you know, Nathan, you and I talk about being homeschooled at times and how like we it teaches you early on that like if you create a system or you do your work in this way, then you have more free time. Um, and so for me now, as especially as an artist, I need free time to do my art, you know, and I need free time to do that in one sense. But in a work context, I want to do as much art as I can. Um, I want to tell as many stories as I can. Um, and so for me, that's the motivating factor. So I think it's I think it's really important to figure that out because a system in itself, unless you're a systems person, like I'm actually not like a systems person in the sense where like I get excited about systems. There are people, you know, probably I can work it. Yes. I can think about their eyes lighting up and that's great. But like that is not me. I, I don't have any emotional attachment to the system itself. I have emotional attachment to what it allows me to do. Um, and and, you know, I also knew early on that, you know, people who write profiles, I mean, they typically write like, you know, 20 in their career um, and people who work at magazines, they don't write that many. And so I knew that um, 
to produce what we needed to produce. <laughs> like I needed to get really savvy about how we did this. And so, you know, that's my motivation. So I think it's about finding out what is yours? Like, what do you really care about? Mm -hmm. And how can a system help you get there? Because otherwise you're just never gonna wanna create one because it's easier. And I'm a pretty intuitive person, you know? So it can be easier to kind of just feel like, oh, I do it this way and it, and it works. Um, but I think, you know, finding out how you're, if, what's motivating you will really, really help you because a system will probably help you with a lot of things that are motivating you. But I think making that connection is really important. Um, and then just logging it as you go. I think a lot of people when they first see, you know, even when they first saw my system, they're like, oh my gosh, and so now I got to like stop what I'm doing, step back and then make a system. No, I've never done that. Um, you're making it as you go. It's just a part of it. And it, it makes it frees up brain space, too. That's another thing. Um, as an artist, I am so passionate about having brain space to be creative, to, to push the boundaries. And I'm not going to have that if I'm constantly feeling stressed about, did I remember this? Did I remember this? You know, I just taught this to my mom who just started her YouTube channel. Um, Cause she was like, so stressed about, did I do the thumbnail? Did I do this? And I'm like, here, here's how you do this as you're doing it. And she got it, she's doing it. And I was so proud. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Cause even just having a checklist of like, if you're setting up your camera or like, okay, before I record, what do I do? You know, and these things, I put the dog in the other room. I, you know, make sure that the camera is focused, you know, and, and if you do those things every time, then, or and you like add and tweak the system, then exactly what you're saying, it frees up so much brain space for like the actual craft of it. Yes, putting the dog in the room was on my webinar checklist and I went through it every single time. And no matter how many webinars I do, and you know, I do the same with my, a packing list anytime I go anywhere. Um, I, there's always something, you know, cause I'll do a lot of intuitively and then I'll go to my list and, and check it all off. And like, yeah. there's always something that I might miss. And so the checklist also gives you a lot of peace of mind. Um, and I think that helps you perform better. It certainly did me. Yeah. One other thing that stories have done for us, uh, as we go back to that is I remember a few years ago, we were constantly scrambling for uh, examples to use in our marketing. We didn't want to be the kind of company where we were like, uh, it's just here's the screenshots of our software, you know, and here's this feature and that feature. We wanted to be able to say, this is how it's being used. And these are the outcomes that it's creating and all of that. And I just remember every time as Charlie would be designing our homepage or uh, whatever else, it would be this like, okay, but who can we put there? Do we have a good image? You know, it'd be the headshot from their site, which may not be that good. And it's not, uh, like a lifestyle shot. It's not them in their environment. And now we just have this massive uh, repository of imagery, of videos, everything to pull from. And so we've, we've even made uh, new ads where the videos are, it's just a collection of uh, footage from, you know, the stories that we filmed. So what are some of the deliberate things that you do to set the rest of the team up for success of using stories throughout the rest of their work? Yeah, I think, you know, that listening has been, you know, the the most important thing. So just as I, you know, was so um, into the chat as a webinar producer and how in many ways that informs my story, um, for me, it was just always, and this is a practice I always have, is just like this kind of listening of the company. And for us, that might look like Slack and Basecamp and reading things and paying attention in meetings. We have the state of the business meeting that I listen to the recording to every Friday. And that's always been something, um, you know, I always wanted to be super plugged in as a webinar producer because I was like the face of the company and I used to know right. what was going on. Um, so with stories, I just took, I continued that. And I was like, I want to know what's going on. And um, so that I'm integrating that from the very beginning. So when I choose someone to do a story about, right? It, there's certainly, you know, I have my own sense of what makes a good story and and whatnot, but that's not the only thing I'm using. When I'm look, choosing someone, I'm thinking about the company as a whole, you know, who we're, who we want to appeal to, um, who we want to help, who we want to be for, um, who can I find that's representing that? And so that's super, super important from the beginning. And so I think, 
it's part of every single step um, of the process. And then when I'm asking them in the interview question, when I'm talking to them about how they're using a creator marketing platform, how they're using email and landing pages and how they're selling products, I'm thinking about how can I tell that story in a way that aligns with um, the story we're telling as a company Um, and not in a way that's inauthentic, but like truly just seeing what happens and what I get and then telling that that way. So, That's really important. I never want to be in my own like bubble. Um, For me, it's always important to tell stories in the context of not just the company, but also the creator community. So I'm always reading up and trying to be as plugged in as possible on what's going on um, so that the stories are really fitting that greater context because you're telling stories that happened in the past, right? It's about how they came to be. So I'm always thinking about what's relevant in that story today. Um, How can it help a creator and how does it align with, you know, how can work it can help a creator too. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. And then one of the other things that I think about a lot is the way that we reuse content, you know, that something shows up in, in so many different places. And so I think we tell listeners all the different places, like when a story comes in, it shows up in written form. And then where else we talked about written and, and the podcast and I guess uh, video as well. What are the other places where the, the stories come through? Yes. Yeah, so, um, Nathan, this was your brilliant idea. Um, we also share the photos on Unsplash um, as right. a way for people to, um, you know, use some of these great photos that we're having taken by these incredible photographers. Um, And obviously we get consent from the photographers and every creator can decide whether they want to share, want their photos shared there. Um, But a lot of them have said yes. And so, you know, it's just our way of also giving back to the creator community of sharing this great photography of all these kinds of creations and types of creators that might not have existed in um, kind of that kind of photography library before. So that's another space. Um, The photos are used all over the website um, and social media. And then um, also the content is reused for um, Instagram. So that was something I started, I can't remember exactly when, but I had just been noticing that I was sharing a lot of stuff on my own Instagram stories, like text-based posts, um, inspirational quotes and things. And I just thought, you know, these creators are saying these really inspiring things in these stories, what if we put those quotes on our Instagram and maybe people will share them? Um, and they did. And that's something that um, is just reusing content. So every story part of the flywheel, I go through and read it again. And I pull out the quotes that I think would work really well and write um, a post for that. And, um, you know, that started later. So we still have all these stories that like we haven't done that yet. And so that's something that's in the back of my mind um, is, you know, how do we also go back to some of these archive stories and create more um, content from the stories that are already there. Um, And then we often make a film about someone who we've already done a written story about so far. Mm -hmm. Um, That's not a requisite prerequisite. It just sort of has happened that way where when we look at, okay, who do we want to cast for films? What stories do you want to tell? There's just all these people who we already know um, have these incredible stories that we think also there's even more to tell and there's more to capture visually and, um, that that's also been such a great experience uh, filming and telling those stories. It's just another kind of way of telling a story and um, a real intimate look and, and allowing the creator to, you know, even tell more of their story in their own words and then capture that live photography that Henry does so well. Yeah, oh, it, it's so good. On the photography side, I was just pulling up the stats because I think people will be curious. So we have because of the pandemic, we haven't been doing as many photos in person, or we didn't for quite a while now. Now we're kicking that off more. But of the 130 photos that we've put on Unsplash uh, in the last couple of years, they've picked up 45 million views and been downloaded and used 250,000 times. That's even an idea. And we mentioned Cortland. Uh, Cortland's the uh, founder of Indie Hackers. And he just, with the photo shoot that we did with him, his story is incredible. Um, but then also the photo shoot that we did, he just, he has this like moody podcast set up, you know, and it's so good. We have him on our login page, but I was going through like creator economy companies like teachable. And there's a bunch of others that all use Cortland and the, our photo of him in like their marketing and everything. Yep. <laughs> um, and it just cracks me up. Cause it's like, Oh, that's our photo, you know? And there's these other ones. Um, like I'm just scrolling through the unsplash collection and, and, uh, there's one of uh, Austin, who's this amazing uh, 
animator, you know, like doing drawings and stuff like that. And that's been downloaded or been viewed over a million times. Uh, there's another one that, let's see, which one is this? Oh, uh, Chai Chai, who uh, her story, like it's actually a photo of her like using ConvertKit. And that's been downloaded 3,000 times and been viewed 900,000 times. And you're like, that's some pretty good brand impressions because she's actually just like browsing the homepage of ConvertKit in the photo. <laughs> and so I'm imagining like thousands of times out there on the web, people are using that photo uh, and those brand impressions for ConvertKit. And then the last thing where all of this gets packaged together is in the book in I Am A Creator, you know, where we're taking each thing and just using it everywhere that we can. Because I think a lot of like telling stories is expensive. When we think about the all of your time, Henry's time, um, the support from the team, the photographers we hire, the flights, you know, all of the stuff. And so really the systems that you've designed have made it so that we can reuse it in so many places. If we were just like, here's a story, it's on our blog, done, next. The, the ROI is not there. And so that's why like these flywheels to do it efficiently and then the scale and the reach to put it everywhere is where it's like, okay, now we can afford to spend the money and time to tell stories that we're really, really proud of. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, further that mission of telling more stories and showing people how they can be a creator, what it means to be a creator, and really elevate these incredible creators that are doing um, just amazing work and who have persisted. Uh, and I, I think there's just so much to learn from them. And I, I'm really proud that we're telling those stories because I, I haven't seen them, you know, in this way of creators like this. I haven't seen it anywhere else. And right. so um, I think, you know, that's really special. And the things that those creators say to me about how it feels when we tell their story, what it means to them, how it propels them, you know, and encourages them has also been just such a gift. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, that's a perfect place to wrap up. Where should people go to follow you personally in your writing and then also uh, read and, and listen to all the stories that you're telling? Yeah, so you can follow um, me on Instagram or I just started a TikTok or Twitter um, at Issa Adney, I-S-A-A-D-N-E-Y. And then you can read and or watch or listen to all of our amazing stories at convertkit.com slash stories. And the website is gorgeous. It was designed by our creative director, Charlie Prangley. It was also a something I had in my head probably for two and a half years. Um, and it is alive and it is beautiful. So go check it out. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ethan.